World of Warcraft is in the middle of extraordinary times. The MMO will be turning 17 years old this month. And while Blizzard prepares for the launch of a new patch, 17 years old, that's crazy. It is also looking within to fix its own culture under the backdrop of a state investigation into sexual harassment issues. Last week, I had a chance to talk with World of Warcraft director Ian S. Costas, asked him about what's happening inside Blizzard and the World of Warcraft team since the investigation became public. We also talked about the changes that World of Warcraft is seeking in the upcoming 9.1.5 patch and beyond. It's a long and frank discussion, and you can read the edited transcript of the exchange below. The World of Warcraft team has been changing or removing some of the game's emotes and art. What's the thought process behind changes? All right, I'm actually interested in this one. What we did was just set up a process internally for folks across the team, as well as sourcing some feedback from the community as a whole to flag pieces of the game for a review, whether it's old quests or specific lines. As a random example, there were a number of jokes and references made a dozen years ago about how feminine male blood elves were, mistaking male blood elves for women. Just poking fun at that in a not necessarily good spirited way. That doesn't sit right in 2021. That's the sort of thing that was reviewed by a broad group that reflects the diversity of our team today. Because of the nature of the feedback loop in the community and the way we publish new builds during the public test realm cycle and fan sites data mining them, every one of these changes ends up getting a huge spotlight shown on it alongside uh, class balance changes or new systems we're adding. This is a massive patch, but this is not something that took the entire team offline. Okay, so I've already knew, I already knew that... Um, this has been like, this totally has been blown out of proportion, right? This whole thing. And I already knew from some tweets that I saw on Twitter from like people that work at Blizzard, like employees, um, that these changes were really something that the team itself has asked for. And that also people from the community has asked, asked them to do. The whole thing definitely was blown out of proportions. But the thing that I don't understand and apparently... It really seems like they almost use it as an excuse here for the backlash that they got is the fact that we have websites like Wowhead. Let's be honest here. When they say when they say fan sites, they mean Wowhead. Yes, like they clearly mean Wowhead, right? So they're basically saying that if Wowhead wouldn't have data mined it and published it on their website, then no one would have noticed. Which Yes, that is true. Like, I, I totally agree. That is very likely true that no one would have noticed and it wouldn't have been a big deal. But the thing is, we have Wowhead now. Like, that is just a reality now, right? That's the reality we live in. So at that point, I wouldn't say stuff like, oh, well, it wouldn't have been a big problem if Wowhead wouldn't publish it. You have to think about a solution for this, right? Because... Why did it blow out of proportion this much? Well, because WoW had published it and because there was no official reasoning from Blizzard behind these changes, right? And I understand there are like PTR cycles where, um, you know, sometimes the things that they change on PTR doesn't even go through to live servers. But clearly these changes were not just like, it's not just one thing that they changed. It's a bunch of smaller things they changed with, with their whole reasoning behind it, right? They had all of these reasons behind making these changes. And it's not just like one change either. And they even thought about doing more of these changes in the future, right? So before you start putting these changes on the PTR, just release like a statement or something beforehand to like stop the outrage to be that big. And I can guarantee you, even if they would have made a statement beforehand, the outrage still would have been there and people would have still been upset about it. But at least it would have been less people upset, I would say, because they might understand the reasoning behind it. And they also might understand that this is just small changes and not going to take the full attention of the team, right? So, yeah, that, that's all I'm saying. Because I personally was not outraged by this. And I personally was like, I understood why they're doing it. And I thought it was fine. The one thing that I don't agree with in this statement here by Ian is this sentence, this paragraph here, right? Basically, they're uh, they're blaming Wowhead when they should find a solution for this for the future, right? Because this is going to keep happening, obviously, because Wowhead is not going to go away unless they unless they somehow change the way they are publishing content, right? 
Wowhead is going to stay. So unless Blizzard changes the way they're publishing content, like either by removing PTR completely or by having different ways of applying patches, then this is going to continue to happen, right? And in my opinion, they have to address that issue. Like, I think they have to address this issue because uh, they can't constantly say, oh, well, if Wowhead wouldn't have said anything, no one would have noticed because, yeah, I mean, Wowhead is just there and it's not going to go away. All right, so you mentioned how some people say, why do this instead of that? One thing they mentioned is cycling in-game toxicity. Can you talk about what Blizzard is doing to combat that inside the game? All right, so for many people, their unpleasant, their painful WoW experiences aren't the result of a line of NPC uh, sad, but something that was said to them in party chat or jokes they saw in general chat or otherwise. We've been working to improve our handling of this on all fronts. We've been consulting with the Overwatch team and our broader shared tech group to use machine learning to better catch a lot of these things in real time, as opposed to relying on a very manual reporting driven process. That's what WoW was built around 17 years ago. And that sort of process maybe works well with someone who's spamming sales or whatever in Orgrimmar, but it doesn't work so... Wait, what? He's under the assumption that the system works well with someone spamming sales in Orgrimmar? I'm a bit confused. <laughs> That's it? Because uh, I have some news for you, Ian. <laughs> I don't think that is working really well. <laughs> I hope that's not their stance on that. I hope they don't think that's okay what's currently happening. Because this sentence makes, makes me almost think otherwise. I really hope that Blizzard thinks that all of the sales spamming is a problem. Because if they don't think it's a problem, then that's never gonna get fixed. Because that's messed up. I feel like there aren't like any super real solutions though for the problem, other than that they're consulting with the Overwatch team and tech group, right? Which could mean anything, right? <laughs> that seems like it's a very far away solution because they're just consulting, right? There isn't any concrete idea. It's just, oh yeah, we're consulting. It, it maybe happened at some point. The one problem that I have a lot with Blizzard, and I think a lot of people have the, the problem with Blizzard, is that I don't know what's going on within their company, but things take four ever to get done like it, that's just what it feels like most of the time right it always feels like there's some internal problem with how they process stuff and it just takes like an eternity to actually uh, like for something to actually happen and I feel like that's a big problem and I hope they're somehow resolving that issue uh, internally because yeah it almost always seems like everything they do is way too late. And that's just always, that's just has always been a thing at Blizzard for like a really long time. They're just, they're just always late with everything, right? They're just always late. Oh my God, I wish they wouldn't be always late. <laughs> I mean, I understand the game is an old game, but the things they're late on all the time is just crazy. Yeah. Like even with the whole esports thing, right? I mean, that's a different kind of story and wow, it's not really an esporty game, but... Still, it just always feels like they could have done so many things so much sooner. And um, anyway, moving on. <laughs> so, uh, actually, I scroll past. You mentioned making a team more diverse. Can you talk more about that? That effort. Recognizing that the game industry has had certain skews, male uh, dominated is one obvious one, especially in design. We need to work harder to build and find the qualified candidates who are out there. We can't just open up position, take the first couple dozen resumes, look through them and pick someone out of that pile because we may just get a couple of dozen with male white male resumes. And it's not that we wouldn't hire someone who is qualified for the job, we will, but we'll be limiting the range of perspectives that come to our team. Again, this is not um, about any preferential decisions in the hiring process itself. It's about working harder to understand how our job descriptions, uh, the way we're sourcing candidates, the way referral work, and all the rest are filtering out qualified candidates of other backgrounds before they even make it to us. And then once we're in interviewing people, we're going to pick the best person for the job at the time. But doing that extra work up front, we have found and continue and find leads to a more diverse team that is more reflective of the country that we are in and the player base that plays our our um, game globally. Okay, I really love. I, I really like that. That's um, 
that that's a very good approach on on how to change or how to be more diverse in the gaming industry because the gaming industry obviously has been uh, very not diverse um, for the longest time, which obviously creates kind of a problem where well, how do you make it more diverse now? Because if everyone, if like if ninety percent of the people who work in like gaming development is white males, well then what do you do about that, right? You can't just force somebody else into the into a job if they're not qualified for it, right? That kind of makes no sense. So, uh, so some people in the past or some companies in the past uh, tried to like force a certain like um, and like we need to have a woman for this job specifically, right? And that's that's obviously uh, like a bad approach in a sense, right? Because if you're specifically looking for a woman uh, and you're like going to ignore the skill and uh, everything else that comes with um, the job and you're just going for the best woman instead of the best person that applies, then that's obviously not the greatest thing to do. So I really like their approach here. Uh, I, I've never heard about this approach at all and I think it's actually really cool. So what they're trying to do is they're basically... Um, working on the way they talk about the open positions, for example. Like they're, they're looking at the, um, the description of the position of the job and see, okay, maybe this description needs to be rewritten in like a different way to make sure that it's not only attracting those like, you know, wide males that we always get for this job, you know? And then they also look at other things too. So instead of, instead of forcing uh, diversity into a job, they are changing the way they look for the people uh, to make sure that the people who apply for the job are more diverse, right? So instead of having a hundred white males apply for a job, you might have like, you know, like maybe there's like 20 women in there and uh, some black people, some different orientations, some, I don't know, right? So that might be, um, there's a really good approach in, in my mind, right? Personally, I think it's really smart. What kind of changes um, have you noticed inside of Blizzard in the past few months? A lot of what we heard in listening sessions and focus groups, talking to the team as a whole, and all the members of the team, especially the women in the team in light of the allegation, uh, has led us um, to an increased focus on that sensitivity and trying to build a culture where everyone is aligned in a sort of workplace that we want. I have to say, I've been inspired. It's a It's been a challenge for a few months, but I've been incredibly inspired by the team as a whole. The energy and the passion they have brought to the table here and the great work we've done in WoW itself, plus the work that we've done to build the team. When it comes to Blizzard, I do think that a lot of people started working at Blizzard because it's their like passion and because they love the game so much, right? Certainly, especially in the past. And it has come to a point where that might have not been the case anymore, right? In fact, it has not been the case anymore. Like we know that. We know that there have been things going on at Blister that totally uh, is completely different to what it was like 17 years ago where uh, people that started working at Blizzard were just like these gamers who, uh, you know, just loved WoW and they're, you know, they, they want to work at the game that they love and that they're passionate about. And clearly that has been uh, like way, way different now. And I think it also shows in a game where people, where, where this like passion for the game um, does not, like if the passion for the game is gone for the employees and the work environments are horrible and you hate your job and whatever instead of loving it because the work environment is horrible, well, then obviously it will affect the game as well. So I'm thinking, I think that all the things that they do at the workplace are totally also affecting the game itself, probably in the future, I hope. You know, Ian himself says that he's inspired and he sees that the, um, that the team has been inspired and everything. Like, that just seems like a good thing. Of course, that could also just be words. So we're going to have to see how it is in the future. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, yeah, it sounds good, at least, for now. There are a lot of quali quality of life improvements coming to 9.1.5, and a lot of people are excited about those things, but a lot of people have expressed some frustration that they didn't happen sooner. Do you think there's something in the feedback loop that Blizzard can improve? Absolutely. We can always do better at listening to feedback. We can also do better at communicating that 
we've heard feedback. In other areas, it's about watching the mainstream of the web player base. The broad range of the player base evolve. Watching how they are playing the game, what we hear from more than just folks who are content creators or high-end raiders or PvPers, we know of a specific playstyle. But one of the challenges, well, okay, wait a second though. <laughs> Hold on. But they're not listening to those kind of people now. This sentence makes me believe that they thought they were listening to content creators and high-end raiders or PvPers before. Which, I'm, that's just not true. <laughs> right? That's what the sentence seems like. He's, it's, it seems like he's saying, oh, we shouldn't just listen to them, we should also listen to others. I'm a bit confused and why. I'm actually really confused if they think they have been listening to content creators and um, like high-end PvEers and PvPers, then I'm very confused because then conduit energy would have been gone a long time ago, <laughs> right? I don't know. This seems a bit off that they're saying it this way. It definitely seems a bit off. So what we hear from people who are trying to do high-end raiding and also push with keystones, having to choose one covenant and not being able to use the two freely or for these systems was frustrating. We understood that. It wasn't surprising to us. We knew that if this was your orientation of the game, if you're a min-max player, you're going to want to always be optimal. But as we articulated, the goal of the design team was that the core RPG choice, that feeling of weighty decisions of picking this path versus that path, and having a different story you experience versus what your friends experience was going to provide a better experience for a majority of players. And over time, what we continued to hear was even those who initially appreciated that choice, the diversity of experience months into the game down the line, once they played through those stories, once they'd seen it, particularly on alts, they just wanted ease of change that led us that place here. So here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. Like, I totally agree that their player base has lots of lots of different kinds of players to play for many, many different reasons, right? Like, I 100% I agree. But I'm not sure if Blizzard understands a huge portion of their player base nowadays is part of this kind of min-maxer group. Because what does min-maxing mean? in their eyes. In their eyes, min-maxing means picking the best covenant, right? If, you go, if you're a min-maxer, you're going to want to be, always be optimal. So they are basically saying that a min-maxer is someone who chooses the best covenant. And if that's their idea of min-maxers, then, I mean, how many people pick the best covenant because it's the best and not because they like it more? I would say that's a huge portion of the player base, right? Like maybe they're just living in this world where they want World of Warcraft to be this, like, RPG game, this, like, Final Fantasy-like game. Because let's be honest here, Final Fantasy is way more going in that direction. And the player base that plays Final Fantasy is, is very into the story, very, like, you know, like... They, but World of Warcraft, it's just not. Like, that's just not the same audience, really. In 2021, I just think that people are not like they were 17 years ago, right? Min-maxing is just part of the game, kind of. And everyone just kind of does it. Assuming anything else is just bad in my mind. Like, assuming that your min-max players are not the vast majority of your player base, I think that's wrong. And I hope they understand that. I'm not sure if they did understand that. Because this article, or this paragraph here, doesn't make me believe that. Because he's saying... What's going to provide a better experience for a majority of the player base? So he's assuming that the min-maxers are the, the minority and the people who want RPG choices are the majority. Which clearly is not true. It's, it would be a fundamental issue if they have not learned that now. It would be a fundamental problem for the future of World of Warcraft if they have not understood that uh, this is just not true, right? And it really does, this, this paragraph does not read that way either, as if they understood. They're saying in, it's bad for the game that the culture is based around min-maxing, it can be rewired. Oh, it can totally not be rewired, no. I, I hard disagree. Unless they're willing to lose most of their player base. Which they're clearly not willing to, otherwise they wouldn't... Um, I mean, obviously, they're not willing to do that, right? A lot of these things, like I mentioned regarding conduit energy, are outgrowths of lessons that were taught to us by our predecessors, by the founders and the leaders of the team about the importance of meaningful choice 
the importance of preserving character investment that may have led to us not being friendly to alt gameplay and people's ability to get caught up on their alts. The reality is, the way people play the game has evolved. Oh my god, they are acknowledging it here. What was the right answer for the WoW player base and for a game 15 years ago may not be today. We're some, uh, there's some stubbornness, but clinging to those old lessons, some things are hard to let go when you're training and your education as a designer and the developer and the team is... Oh my god, they're literally addressing what I just said. I'm so glad now. <laughs> so 9.1.5 reflects a shift towards more alt accessibility, more catch up, more sensitivity, and respect for players' time. Trying to look at what sort of activities are going to be interesting once or twice, but maybe less interesting when you have to do them more than that. That's what make you do them more than that. Thank you. Versus which activity are part of the core repeatable loop, like running dungeons or PvP at max level. Things people want to get into without as many hurdles they have to clear on the way. That sort of approach is going to motivate how we approach our next patch in Shadowlands, which we'll talk about in the not too distant future and expansion to follow. Okay, well, I was thinking about this very negatively after this first paragraph, but after the last few paragraphs, I have more hope now. Talking about community requests and maybe stubbornness is something like cross-faction rating a bit more on the radar as possibility these days. I'd say that it's a bit more on the radar, yes. That's one of those areas where a lot of things to solve, a lot of things to figure out to make it happen. But at the end of the day, if Jaina and Thrall are working alongside each other in the raid, why can't Alliance and Horde players also work alongside each other in the raid? Especially when we know it's going to solve a lot of the social problems people are grappling with. Particularly trying to keep a high-end Alliance skill together in North America or Horde on one in Oceana. I really, really like that he's agreeing with this. But this first sentence is a bit, it's like a, a very like far distant thing that it's under radar, but you know, like maybe like five years, right? But the, the question was asked that way. So I, you, could, you, could, uh, you could say it's because of the question, because the question was a bit, is it a bit more under radar these days? So I guess he was just answering with, you know, the words that were in the question. So I'm just going to put it off. And I assume that this is more likely than what it seems after this first sentence. <laughs> All right, well, that's a good thing. That's great, that's great. I hope it's sooner than later, though. Like, even if it's next expansion, I would say that's soon enough, right? Next expansion, cross rating, that would be great. And it would make so much sense to you. I feel like next expansion, it could be, like, written into the lore. You could say, like, oh, because Jaina and uh, Thrall work together, like, blah, blah, blah. It just all makes sense, kind of. You talked about 9.2 a bit, but beyond that, should we expect a 2.5 or a, a 0.3 for this expansion cycle? Or will it be 9.2 and then looking toward the next thing? We'll be talking a bit more about the conclusion to Shadowlands in more detail in the future. Yes, 9.2 is coming. You'll be hearing about that more soon. We do have more planned after that. But it's hard to say too much more without almost spoiling some of the story that's going to come. We'll have a lot of detail on that soon, but we want to be able to explain it in the full context of what 9.2 is going to be. Okay, that's a non-answer. We've seen a story and setting for Warcraft get bigger and more cosmic. Some people like that and some people don't. But I guess I wonder, is it possible to go back? Or is the genie out of the bottle as far as the size and scope of what we're fighting? I don't think it is, no. That's definitely feedback we hear as well. Here are some who, um, there are some who like that escalation. We face the titans, what comes next? There's others who miss just being in, a, in an inn in Elwyn Forest, being an adventurer on a more humble scale. At this point, the WoW protagonists are heroes. You've done a lot of stuff. You'll probably never go back to being anonymous adventurers in the forest. But why not? Wait, that means they're excluding like a soft reset of the story though, right? Aww. Yeah, that kind of is an exclusion as a soft reset. Oh man, okay. This patch is adding Legion time walking. We're getting Mage Towers back. Is the team thinking more about what ways to bring back old content? Oh, that's an interesting question. It's something that we're slowly working on our way toward. There's a tre tremendous amount of content that needs to be, in many cases, manually retouched and updated to work in this way. Yeah, that's a problem. A lot of discussions about what um, outdoor world time walking might look like and whether there are periods where there will be exciting stuff that will make you want to return to Pandaria or Draenor. As we've seen, when a specific storyline does tie into an old area, uh, we will send you back to High Mountain or Valshara in Legion to play through a modern questline in the old area. They really should make time walk ra time walking 10-man raids. If they, if they want to do time walk raiding, it should be 10-man raids. Wouldn't that be great? Oh my god, I think, I think that would be great. Because if they have to change it anyway, 
if they have to change the way the bosses work and the scaling and everything, just make it in that 10-man raid. I think that would be so much cooler. You mentioned earlier that the game's almost 17 years old now. Is there a point where it's just too old with too many story threats, too many systems, and a reboot comes too enticing to ignore? Huh. I don't think so. Oh man. <laughs> We're always thinking about what is the future of WoW, not just a year or two from now, but five or ten years. Within this world, there are plenty of stories we will have to tell, place to visit, and improvements to make. We want to learn lessons and keep building on these foundations. In a lot of ways, having that 17 years of content is a huge strength. Is it though? It's more of a weakness, I would say. <laughs> it's an incom incomparable strength. But we also need to be mindful of managing the overall bloat in our systems. That's kind of what some of the efforts we did in Shadowlands. Like squishing and streamlining leveling. So a new player coming aboard can play through a modern starting experience, play through Battle for Azeroth and jump right into Shadowlands. Rather than being overwhelmed by 120 levels and a whirlwind to a uh, tour of 15 years of worth of content, much of which is old. But even as we curate and maintain what that experience is, we have this wealth to draw upon. And our intent is to keep evolving upon those foundations. We'll remove some parts that are old and crusty, we'll add a lot of exciting new ones, but there are millions of folks who are excited to play WoW and we'll keep supporting it for as long as that's the case. Well, uh, I mean, overall, I guess, yeah, I mean, overall, it's a, like a good, it's a good interview, right? Most of the answers were pretty promising, I would say. Uh, there were some parts in, in that inter interview that I'm like questioning. But overall, it was like a good thing, right? I'd say.